future. Why is time travel fun? Here we go. Because who doesn't wonder about the past? Who doesn't wonder about the future? If somebody comes back from the future to change what happened, are we basically in a movie that's already been shot? I'll be back. Time travel stories embrace the potential that we might open up new timelines, new worlds, and new possibilities for ourselves as people. That kind of imagination which can see through everything. What are we always trying to do when we tell stories about time travel? What I'm always trying to do is to touch people. Yeah. In the heart. Today I'm the age you were when you left. It would be a real good time for you to come back. If we can go any place we want in time, time is no longer our jailer. Every second of our past makes us who we are. And the idea that we could relive that or view it from another perspective is so human and so spiritual that I think it touches everyone. You've basically covered just about every base <laughs> in science fiction, from alien contact, <laughs> monsters, space travel, everything. And you executive produced the Back to the Future the series, series of films, yeah. three films. Do you think time travel is possible? I asked Stephen Hawking that one day when I worked with Errol Morris. How many people get to say that? <laughs> but when I was working with Errol Morris as his executive producer on the documentary on Stephen Hawking's uh, book, mm -hmm. Brief, History Brief History of, of time. time, I asked Stephen Hawking that question because Back to the Future had just come out. Mm -hmm. And Stephen Hawking said, it's very possible to go into the future, but impossible to go back into the past. Hey, we're time traveling right now, <laughs> like one minute per minute. <laughs> so he kind of was alluding to the fact that everything at Back to the Future you know, couldn't really, could never happen. Couldn't really happen. The classical idea of a time machine, which you can go into it at one point in time and come back out the other side at some other point in time. It's almost certainly impossible. But what's beautiful about filmmaking is you don't have to listen to the physicist. Whether or not time travel exists, it speaks to that question of free will, essentially. That's the question we're playing with when we're playing with time travel. It opens up all sorts of fascinating thought experiments about how that might play out. In the summer of 1980, I discovered my father's high school yearbook, and that was where the proverbial bolt of lightning struck. What if you could go to high school with your dad? And what if your mom went to the same high school? Don't I know you from somewhere? Yes, I'm your density. Who wouldn't want to be a fly on the wall on their parents' first day, right? So in Back to the Future, a kid named Marty McFly accidentally goes back in time dad! and interferes with the event that made his parents meet and fall in love. So Marty has two problems. One, he has to get back to 1985, but before he can do that, he has to make sure that he puts the love affair between his father and his mother back on track. Everybody has that fantasy, time travel. And I feel Back to the Future just makes it so rich, the possibility with a kid, this crazy guy, and a DeLorean, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, my God. So there have been time travel stories in the past, such as Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, in which Scrooge travels by means of dream visions that allow him to visit the past and the present and the future. In Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, our protagonist is bonked on the head, and that's what returns him to medieval England. We never bought that stuff. We wanted it to be scientific. It's got to be via a time machine of some sort. So that would be some guy who invented time travel in his garage. And that, of course, is Dr. Emmett L. Brown. Doc? Don't say a word. I just love this doc who is 
feverishly trying to invent everything he could imagine inventing. And time travel, of course, would be the ultimate. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious His excitement about achieving that was incredible. I loved it. Mark, action. Movies like Back to the Future provide a kind of tutorial about how paradoxes are things you can play with. Prior to this point in time, somewhere in the past, the timeline skewed into this tangent, creating an alternate 1985. It's necessary for Doc to say it, not just for the audience to be caught up with a story, but because he's got to say, I've got to do this because of this, because if that happens, then you've got this going. Marty, whatever happens, you must not let your other self see you. The consequences could be disastrous. Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> he's in total terror that one mistake of judgment and the whole cosmos could collapse. This is the thing that every writer ever always struggles with in time travel stories. If you go back in time and something that you do when you're back there causes the death of your grandfather before he has impregnated your grandmother, and you therefore cease to exist. Right. But if you cease to exist, then you wear it around to get in the time machine in the first place and to go back in time and do that. So what happens? <laughs> they call it the grandfather paradox. Now remember, according to my theory, you interfered with your parents' first meeting. If they don't meet, they won't fall in love, they won't get married, and they won't have kids. Back to the Future laid out its rules so clearly, it effectively taught the movie audience, this is what happens when you change the past, this is what an alternate timeline might look like. There were also kind of creepy questions, like what happens when your mom falls in love with you as a teenager. The most memorable piece is Marty's photograph of himself from the 80s, which he carries around with him back into the 50s and keeps looking at it to make sure he's still in the picture. Erased from existence. So the photograph itself is obviously incredibly paradoxical because why would his brother and sister be there if his parents had never met? And like, why would there even have been a photograph in the first place? But nobody ever stops to think about that because We've set up this rule that says that when Marty disappears from this photo, he's going to fade out of existence. It's a perfect dramatization of the idea of erasing yourself from the timeline. Time travel movies sort of invent whatever device will create the best story. Back to the Future really sets up a mousetrap to create the perfect kind of suspense. Travel opens up a lot of possibilities. So you can have an alternate history, you can have an alternate present. It allows us to change a lot of different weird things about our reality. And the possibilities are kind of limitless. Why is so much of our fantasy, our, you know, our, our imagination in the science fiction genre taken up with this idea of time travel? Because we can't do it. I think it is just wonderful to see it on the screen and to imagine ourselves being in that situation. I would have loved to be able to time travel. Yeah. I mean, imagine to go back and to say, I'm not going to do Hercules in New York. My name is Hercules. Hercules, Hercules, give me the dough. I mean, it's like, it's like unbelievable. <laughs> That's the thing you want to go oh, back. Man, it's the first thing that Not meet Jesus, not kill Hitler. You, go, you want to go back and, and fix that one movie. Well, this haunts to, you, doesn't it? To kill it? Hitler or to go and be back in the Roman days, uh, wow, that would be really interesting yeah. to be able to time travel. But the question is, if you can move back and forth in time, do we have free will? Right. Because the Terminator movies are kind of about that. They're about free will. If somebody comes back from the future, to change what happens down there, then are we just all puppets of a timeline? Well, I have and total faith in you that you will figure it out. There's an interesting theme in Terminator about can we change the past? Can we change the future? And what you see is the future coming back to destroy the past. 
The Terminator coming back to try to kill Sarah Connor also brings back Kyle Reese, who becomes the father to John Connor and creates the leader of humanity. The time machine was a mechanism to put the Terminator and also Michael Bean, the soldier, into the past. That character was sent by John Connor in the future to go back in time to protect this girl from the Terminator. Once they're there, then you have this chase. Who's going to rescue Sarah Connor, or is she going to get killed? Science fiction is a great place to ask, is our destiny fixed, or can we change it? I didn't do anything. No, but you will. And the question is, are we locked into one series of events? Like, by the end of the first film, you realize you're seeing the creation myth of the thing they've gone back to prevent in the first place. The second film opens up the possibility, and Sarah Connor speaks to it directly, maybe that's not the universe we're stuck in, that maybe the future isn't written. Sarah sticks a knife at the table and says, there's no fate but what we make for ourselves. She's been told that she can change the future. But is that just an illusion? Are we basically in a movie that's already been shot? It's already rolled up in the can someplace? And you, can <laughs> that play could it, be. you can play it <laughs> forward and backward as much as you want, but the ending never changes? I think that we have control over ourselves, and I think that we have the power to create changes. Your son gave me a message to give to you. The future is not set. You must survive or I will never exist. The future is not set, you know? I mean, that's, that's kind of the line. The future is not set. And it can be altered. Should I tell you about your father? If you don't send Kyle, you can never be. The point that the film makes is that you can change history. You can't escape the Terminator. But time travel is not about history. And it's not about time travel. It's about accepting responsibility for all the possibilities in your own life. The idea of taking the wrong turn and making a correction later on, it's not a new idea in science fiction. It's not even a new idea in the movies. Looper is one where you're essentially trying to not change the world, but change your world, change your life. In Looper, the time traveler is a hitman, wouldn't you know? He's a hitman played both by Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis. When you agree to be a Looper, it's not a long-term job. There's not much of a future in it. One day, you know that your future self is going to show up in front of you. And you're going to have to shoot him. That's going to be his final hit to kill himself. And he and all of the other loopers enter into this bargain. And you have to do it. If you don't do it, it's a really big problem. The older one, the Bruce Willis character, knows the whole story. But the younger one is learning for the first time what's, what's going on. And he naturally has a few questions. It's about changing your own destiny, and it's kind of about how your destiny is always being shaped by people more powerful than yourself. And how do you really get out of a dark cycle? The movie is pointing out another way to end that cycle. So I changed it. It is an existential dilemma. A lot of time travel is very philosophical in that way. Joe finally takes control of his life by ending it. Why are we fascinated by time travel? Well, you know, people very often ask me, why am I interested in time? I say, well, because I've always lived in it. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, and we are. We, we feel very trapped in it. It's like we try and hang on to the moment. We take photographs of everything. Right. We take, you know, right. We desperately want to hang on to this reality, and it recedes. Yeah. yeah. What time travel allows us to do is to say, OK, but what if we could? What if we could yeah. preserve that moment? What if we could revisit that moment yeah. genuinely? Well, that's all science fiction is about what if. Yes. What if we could travel through space? Yeah. What if we could travel through time? What makes Interstellar so compelling is that the filmmakers devise these turns of plot 
to create a real classic family story with the deepest possible emotions. Fundamentally, Interstellar is about the human cost of time travel. It's a deeply and intensely personal drama and a story of what happens when a father is separated from his child. It says stay! <laughs> Coming back. When? Will he go and save humanity or will he stay with his daughter instead? I mean, by the time I get back, we, we might even be the same age. Ah, oh, Murph. You have no idea when you're coming back. Interstellar projects us into the near future in which the world has gone through uh, an enormous global catastrophe. Nelson's torching his whole crop. Light? They're saying it's the last harvest for okra ever. I play Cooper's father-in-law. Matthew McConaughey plays Cooper, a former astronaut who by several turns of plot goes shooting into outer space. We've got to move to another planet or we'll not survive. Interstellar is an unusual time travel film because instead of building a literal time machine and having it be about an invention, it's about the way time works in space, the way that it speeds up or slows down depending on wormholes and gravitational pull. I think there are all sorts of different ways of looking at time travel. And when I came to do Interstellar, which is not a time travel movie, but has that element in it. It does fold time at the end. It does. You still approached it very rigorously. Yes. By going to some of the top experts. It was a really fascinating part of the process because Kip Thorne, who was one of the original... Caltech, leaders, I think, right? Caltech. Yeah. And Kip is one of the great minds in you know, physics. What he taught me is that once you can grasp those physical concepts, the concepts of astrophysics, they, they offer you this great launching pad for story possibilities mm -hmm. to do with relativity and all right, these time these dilation. Aspects. Exactly. There are two forms of time travel. There's the time travel that is probably impossible, and that's going backwards. Then you have time travel, which is not only possible, but already a feature of our world, which is time dilation forwards. In uh, science, there's this thing called the twin paradox, which basically says if my twin gets in a spaceship and goes traveling near to the speed of light and then returns to Earth, when my twin gets back to Earth, my twin will be younger than I am. That's a form of time travel. And that is actually brilliantly illustrated in the movie Interstellar. Go, 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 go. Seven years per hour here. Let's make it count. Interstellar explored in the most advanced way how time travel really might work. When they go to the water planet, time works differently. They come back to their ship, and the guy who stayed on the ship has grown old. I've waited years. <laughs> Many years. By now it must be. It's 23 years, four months, eight days. Interstellar suggests that time travel will always have a certain kind of trade-off. So on the one hand, the scientist's ability to travel through space and time is essential to saving humanity. But the fact that he has to go on this journey in the first place and to be separated from his daughter for most of her natural life suggests the very real cost. Hey, Dad. Hey, Mary. You son of a bitch. There are moments when Matthew is allowed to see his daughter by uh, video stream. It's absolutely heartbreaking. You once told me that when you came back, we might be the same age. And today I'm the age you were when you left. This might be a real good time for you to come back. People talk about my kid was born and I blinked and I sent him off to college. The movie is literally about that. The sacrifices that go along with whatever it is that you've given your life to at the expense of these moments with your family, which I think is the very poetic part of Interstellar. So if Interstellar explores the human cost of time travel, Primer does something very similar but it does so in a different way. We have two everyday engineers who accidentally create time travel. 
Some people think it's the most credible, complicated time travel movie done on a very low budget. Do you know who directed that? Shane Carruth. He's in it. He's lovely in it. Wow. What does it feel like? I don't know. I don't know if I'm making it up. These two guys, Abe and Aaron, keep investigating this phenomenon. There's this weird anomaly that shows up. What they finally realize is that they have created a space that you can travel through time. And so they take this and create a bigger box, big enough for a human to be in. When they do this, they use it for really mundane and very human purposes. One uses it to play the stock market, and time travel ends up pulling the friends apart. I just want to know what box you used. You built the one for you, right? Just the one. Yeah, how many do you think I built? They are suspicious of each other, and they're also deceiving each other because something about going back in time affects their brain, and they do start losing their minds. Like many other movies, Primer does indeed suggest that there is a cost to time travel, and in this case, the cost is both emotional and physical. What's on your hand? Are you bleeding? So when we start seeing our characters show up and they've got, you know, bloody ears and they lose the ability to write, their right-handed writing looks like their left-handed writing, there's something going on mentally that they are paying the price with. The time travel story, it's a kind of Faustian tale, the bargain with the devil. Everything is a barter. If you sell your soul to the devil, you can have everything you ever dreamed of but eventually you pay the piper. Who doesn't wonder about the past? Who doesn't wonder about the future? How many times has that game been played? You know, if you could go back in time, where would you go? Can you remember the first time you ever heard of time travel? The ancient Greeks must have had time travel. Isn't there some time travel thing in Shakespeare, right? But there isn't. Time travel is new. Time travel is a new idea. Before H.G. Wells, it didn't exist. What Wells gave the time travel story was the machine. The idea that somebody could build a machine that would do for time what rocket ships would do for space. And the idea was just irresistible. It's literally true that the words time and travel in English were never used together before H.G. Wells invented this character that he called the time traveler. The night came like the turning out of a lamp, and in another moment came tomorrow. The laboratory grew faint and hazy, then, then fainter, fainter and, and even, even fainter. fainter. Tomorrow night came black, then day came, night again, day again, faster and faster still. My grandfather, H.G. Wells, wrote that in 1895. This is a, a first edition of The Time Machine. Firstly, he was writing anything he could sell. The novels that we now know, which are these great science fiction novels, came after he'd spent years writing as a journalist. But there was an enormous amount of, of kind of revolutionary science going on at the time. Darwin was talking about the history of human life in terms of millions and billions of years. Archaeologists were doing the same thing. Humanity was developing a longer view of time than ever before. When I speak of time, gentlemen, I'm referring to the fourth dimension. H.G. Wells, the time machine, his character goes forward in time. No problem there. Going back in time, entirely different thing. If you go back in time, then you start running into all sorts of issues with causality. And that's the view that's expressed in the phrase, the butterfly effect. A tiny change, a tiny perturbation in a complex system can have enormous and unpredictable consequences in a fairly short time. And it starts with The Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury. The basic idea of the story is that you can travel back in time, but you're going to be on this suspended platform and you can shoot a dinosaur, but it has to be one that was going to die anyway, so that you don't change anything in the future. And this fairly arrogant game hunter steps off and kills a butterfly. 
and comes back and his future is turned into this kind of dystopian version of his own world that he barely recognizes. Bradbury creates these deep metaphors that give shape to a lot of the way I think people have subsequently understood ideas like time travel. Oh, you, if you change a butterfly in the past, the, the entire future might, might be different. When writers of time travel stories consider the logical implications of everything that happens, they get tied up in these paradoxes. Robert Heinlein is the first writer to get the pleasure and peculiarity of time travel paradoxes and how they can be exploited again and again and again. He sees that the problem with time travel stories isn't a problem, it's an opportunity. He wrote stories like All You Zombies, which has nothing to do with zombies, by the way, but it has to do with probably the most completely confusing and delightful science fiction time paradox story there is which was made into the film Predestination. I can do this, I can change my past. Yes, you can. Have you ever thought about changing yours? I never deviate from the mission. Predestination is about an intersex time traveler who starts life as a woman, is forced into gender reassignment, becomes a man, that man then travels back in time, falls in love with his female self, that female self then has a child, which ends up being the creation of themselves. So it's an intersex, time-traveling, incest uh, love story. And in fact, Playboy magazine rejected the story because all the sex made the editor queasy, the editor of Playboy. Well, I, I think it had to do with the idea of having sex with yourself to create yourself, which is kind of crazy that Playboy would have an issue with something like that but it was 1959. Well, it's the age-old question, which came first, the, the chicken or the egg? Yeah, we say the rooster. Some things are predestined. I, I made you who you are, you made me who I am. It's, it's a paradox, right? But it can't be paradoctored. <laughs> We've had time travel in science fiction movies for most of the 20th century. So I guess the question is, why? Well, because what you're doing is you're exploring possible futures. You're exploring the decisions that we make now. It enables us to imagine what the future would be like or what the past would be like if we interacted with it. It's an incredibly important way of exploring potential futures. The future is now. So many science fiction movies are about these brilliant scientists and astrophysicists, biologists. <laughs> and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure is not. No way. Yes way, Ted! <gasps> In a way, Bill and Ted becomes important just because it's so different from everything else. It makes you think, what is wrong with us, the people writing these films, if we can't imagine the future as anything but awful. Two dudes can be the heroes, man. Ready, Ted? Ready, Bill? Let's go back into history. Alex Winter and I became Bill and Ted. Bill S. Preston Esquire, Ted Theodore Logan. Excellent! Bill and Ted are idiots, and our, our teacher tells us that if we don't pass our history exam, we're gonna fail out of school. The lady in that car over there said that Marco Polo was in the year 1275. So it's not just a water sport, I knew it. If they fail, Ted's dad is gonna send him to military school. And if they're separated, their band will never form and save the world. Someone from the future shows up and says, we're gonna help you. Do you know when the Mongols ruled China? Perhaps we could ask them. Bill and Ted, of course, can accept everything. Dudes, you guys are gonna go back in time. Yeah! They're kind of like these modern fools of kind of an eternal optimism. We had a funny moment, Chris Matheson and I, when we wrote it. We were not involved in the casting of the film and didn't know who would play Bill and Ted. We had flown to Arizona where we were shooting the movie and we were at a McDonald's in line and we saw a couple kids in front of us goofing off, and we were like, those are the guys. That's who should be playing Bill and Ted. And later in that day, we met Keanu and Alex. And those were the guys that were in front of us at McDonald's. And we were like, that's perfect. 
And, you know, of course, we are bequeathed a time-traveling phone booth by George Carlin and set upon a, a mission through space-time and collect all the various characters from history, because that would be the most awesome report you could have would be to actually have the real people there. <laughs> We love toying with all these paradoxes, and one of my favorite parts of the Bill and Ted movie it is when all the historical figures are in jail and they can't get out. Can we get your dad's keys? You could steal them. Good thinking, dude. After the report, we'll time travel back to two days ago, steal your dad's keys, and leave them here. See? Whoa, yeah! So after the report, we can't forget to do this, otherwise it won't happen. Ted is like, connecting to his future self through his present self to know where his future self will want to hide the keys because the future self already knows what the past self did, but the past self doesn't know what the future self did, but he knows the character. Come on, Ted. We've got some historical figures to rescue. And it perfectly encapsulates the absurdity of the time travel paradox. You just have to remind yourself to have done them in the past, and they will be done in the future. And I just thought that was, that was terrific. You know, that just, it just says, yeah, don't worry about it. It's pretty fascinating, honestly, how rare Bill and Ted's excellent adventure is in the grand history of sci-fi films. And to have a sci-fi film that says, eh, this is just fun, is an incredible strange relief. No way! But it's not the only science fiction film to have fun with time travel. In fact, this comedy was the first to popularize a particular form of time travel called the time loop. Rita, I'm reliving the same day over and over. Groundhog Day, today. Groundhog Day uses the device of a time loop as a way to explore ways you need to work on yourself before you can grow up and have meaningful relationships with other people. When I was first brainstorming ideas, I actually wrote on the little index card, Time Machine, but I didn't really know what was going to be involved or how it was going to work. Bill? Bill? Bill Connors? Bill you. I just thought, okay, whatever it is, the rule is he can remember, but nobody else can remember. So for them, it's just the same day. And for him, it's part of a long, long, long repetition of days. And the audience learns to expect that and can begin to sort of map the day along with the character and see if they can figure out how to get out of this time loop before he does. And the real time travel machine is your brain. In here, we're constantly recoiling through different versions of ourselves, memories, and daydreams, alternate paths where we might end up somewhere different. Do you ever have deja vu, Mrs. Lancaster? I don't think so, but I could check with the kitchen. And this is what the time travel story crystallizes for us. It's a model of consciousness, which is constantly reeling with ultimate freedom through time, and then finding itself stuck once again in the real world. In the first stretch of Groundhog Day, Bill Murray knows everything that's going to happen to him. He can make that work to his advantage. And he does it in the way that an adolescent would, just having fun. And also becoming kind of sociopathic. You don't really care about the other people. They are objects in your life. And it, it moves on to a depression where he finally decides to kill himself. And he finds that he cannot even do that. This is Tom. He worked in the coal mine until they closed it down. This is where he, for the first time, starts to notice other people and realize that they have lives, too, and that he's part of a community. And by seeing himself differently, he actually opens up a whole new world to himself. Hello, Father. Let's get you someplace warm. The wonderful thing about being stuck in a time loop, it makes us look at our lives in a fresh way, which is one of the great things that movies can do, and especially science fiction, because it can um, so immediately place you in a different time and place. Maybe we all do need a time travel movie to make us a better version of ourselves, but I hope that we're not stuck as long as he is. Anything different is good. My name is Doctor Who. It's not, is it? I like it. You don't know it yet, but in a short time, you will trust me with your life. Doctor Who is a very British, slightly eccentric, extraordinary series that's been running for more than 50 years now. And it involves a charming, peculiar time lord. We're time travelers. We tread softly. 
He's an alien who has come down to protect us from the, the rest of the universe by traveling through time and by interacting with real historical events in both the past and the future. We are unarmed. You wouldn't open fire on unarmed civilians, would you? It wouldn't be the first time. Juggles, now! Oh, I love Doctor Who. Over the past 50 years, there have been a total of 12 Doctor Whos. Each new performer brings his own thing to it. I've seen literally every episode of Doctor Who that's ever been made, from An Unearthly Child, which is made in 1963, all the way up to the current Peter Capaldi Doctor Whos. You are the Doctor, you are an enemy of the Daleks! Oh, yes, I am. I grew up with the show. You know, I lived in a tenement in, in Glasgow, in Scotland. And through these flickering little uh, blue images, I'd be taken to other planets with strange creatures, with wonderful imaginative designs. Do you think you're the first to try and kill me? And also, there has always been a kind of B-movie element to it, which I've always loved. Is everything out here evil? Hardly anything is evil. But most things are hungry. Hunger looks very like evil from the wrong end of the cutlery. Or do you think that your bacon sandwich loves you back? I think one of the things that's appealing about Doctor Who is there's a tradition of English humor which suggests that the future is, is all a joke. He's a time lord, yes, and he can travel back and forth in time, and he does it in absurd ways. Time and relative dimension in space. TARDIS for short. The Doctor's Time Machine, the TARDIS, is one of the best ever because it, it invokes the playing with physics that is going to be necessary to travel through time and space because his machine is bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. So your box can move. We can go anywhere we like. He always has a human companion, and he brings that companion along with him on his adventures. Where are we? The end of the road. The last planet. He seems to have a special place in his heart for humans, picking individual, ordinary people and showing them all of time and space and giving them a broader view on life. He's the doctor. What do doctors do? They heal sick situations, sick people. But why do you have to destroy? Can't you use your brains? Only to... one race can survive. This senseless, evil killing. The first actor, the wonderful William Hartnell, became ill and couldn't carry on with the show. So they came up with this rather brilliant idea, which is that the doctor has the ability to reconstitute himself. This has allowed the show to last because we change the lead actor every three or four years, which no other show does. It has all these other levels of philosophical uh, and, and reflective nature that make it very, very rich. <laughs> People always ask me, what is it about the show that appeals so broadly? The answer I would like to give, and which I'm discouraged from giving because it is not uh, useful uh, in the promotion of a brand, is that it's about death. And it has a very, very powerful death motif in it, which is that the central character dies. Doctor. Let go. Time is over. And I think that is one of its most potent mysteries, because somewhere in that, people see that that's what happens in life. You have loved ones, and then they go, but you must carry on. There are a lot of ways in which time travel stories sneakily are about eluding death. Time is what kills us, after all. Time is a bastard. There's something that speaks to our souls about time travel where there's a fatalism involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm that is reassuring somehow. Right. Because it tells you that mistakes were always going to happen. Yeah. I mean, one of the fascinating things I was explaining to my kids the other day, that you look at 
your idea of a telescope. A telescope is a way of looking back in time. It's a time machine. Not just space. Yeah. It's a time machine. And you look, the, the smaller the star, the further away, the further back in time you look. Yeah. And theoretically, you could make more and more powerful telescopes and you can look further and further back in time. Which yeah. is, it's just a mind-boggling concept. Yeah. So theoretically, the sun could have gone out seven and a half minutes ago. We just don't know <laughs> yet because it takes light a while to exactly. get here. Exactly. Let's hope not. Yeah. Well, but that idea of looking back in time as you look out to the world, the fact that everything we see in, in this room when you look around, you're looking back in time. I think the potential is limitless for time travel stories. Chris, thanks for doing this. No, well, thank you for having me. It's uh, yeah. exciting to talk about. OK, good. All right, give us a cut, then. I'll give you a cut. Done. Done. Going home. <laughs>